Welcome. It is 6.31 on September 11th, 2024. We are starting the forum on the town garage that uh, has been designed for East Montpelier, and there will be a bond vote in the November election uh, to finance the building of the garage. We're here in the East Montpelier Elementary School with a quorum of the select board, Scott Hess on Zoom, Tom Brazier here with us. I'm Carl Etnair, and um, by consensus of the select board members who are here, I'm chairing the meeting. Uh, we'll begin with um, any comments from members of the public. Are there any members of the public here who would like to comment? Michael, no, you're here to listen. Okay, okay. Stephen. Stephen, would you like to comment? Yeah, I forgot to turn on my audio, sorry. Um, okay. I'm interested in a breakdown of the cost. And, uh, if it's not asking too much. Is that possible? What do we have? Would you like to introduce yourself? So hi, my name is John Lamoth. I'm with William & Lamphere Architects. Uh, we have a, our estimator has put together uh, cost estimates based on the uh, couple of design iterations that have been put together. Um, I do not have that in front of me. I don't know if we, if we have it available here. Um, but I we do definitely get that. But it, it, it's it is it's been done, it, and it's if if it's open to the public, we can we can definitely share it. We have you guys have you have it right. Uh, okay, I would think it would be open to the public. We'll have, have to take a look at record, it. So. We'll have to take a look at it. Make sure it's not an exception to the public records law. But it sounds so, sounds like it would be it would be, be okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So we'll take a look at that and get back to you, Stephen. We have that for the Saturday meeting on November second. We can we can certainly provide it to you. Yeah. It, prior to that, if you'd like, or we can get it. No, I'm just thinking that it would be great to have it for people to be able to understand what it is that we're buying. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will make a note of that request and seek to satisfy it. Any other questions or comments? We do have a presentation. We just ask questions. We did do a presentation uh, the last time we were here. Maybe you can do an overall view. Yeah, you, would you like so to do that, John? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Where, where we are. Okay. Uh, Do I need to get out of the way? So. No, I think, I think you're fine. Okay. Uh, so How about me being behind you? And if, for the TV. If I'm not loud enough, we can. I can be louder. Um, so do we have a? I'm. I'm just going to get out of the way, so I'm not obstructing the camera. Those were Andy's. So we can. Start with the floor plan. Uh, are you familiar with the site where it, where it currently exists? Yeah. Okay. So in its current configuration, actually I'll flip this back. So as, as we're looking here, it's almost like where we're standing would be inside of the existing building that would be demolished. Okay. So the the new the new building would have its north facing overhead doors so the road it would be to its south here okay so excuse me for the folks online could you move that chart to the other position yeah that better <clears throat> okay so north will be up what we were anticipating is to try and keep the the site access kind of protected from from visual which then brings you kind of back to, you know, this this is the view, this is the view from the road. So you're not looking at you know large open doors, provides a little bit more security for the equipment. Um, 
moving back to the plan itself. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six bays open for whatever Guthrie's needs are. Currently we're showing seven pieces of equipment inside, uh, road grader, four plow trucks, um, a six wheeler plow and a bucket loader. Uh, exterior storage would be the exterior and the roadside mower. Um, included in the plan is an office. So Guthrie's office would be in there. We have a break room, mechanical room, bathroom and shower space. Um, most importantly, what we have is kind of a like a tool area, um, equipment storage, uh, something for Guthrie and his guys to be able to maintain their equipment in a tempered space. Um, it allows them to be undercover. Um, it allows that equipment to be secured. Uh, in a building that is both energy efficient and will stand the test of time. So the, the purpose of this is that we are looking for something that we can provide the town of East Montpelier that gives, that gives you something that's, that's going to last a long time, right? I mean, these buildings are not intended to be, you know, thrown up really fast and come down in a couple years. We want this to last. Um, so it's, it's, it's robust. It's, it's well, important. What, what's, a, what's a long time? So these, so these buildings are, I mean, their, their lifeline is supposed to be about 50 years or more. Um, you know, we, we always envision these buildings that, you know, when we're, when cared for properly, they should last longer than, longer than the trucks that are inside them. Right. So, um, so you're looking at, uh, energy efficient systems. So heat pumps, radiant flooring, um, we explored a few options for some, like a, a pellet silo, which we have, we've no longer included in the project, but it was, it was an option that we kind of explored. There was a handful of energy models that were done, kind of comparing different, different design avenues. There were energy models that included different exterior wall assemblies, different roof assemblies. So we kind of explored the design process to understand, okay, what is giving the best bang for the buck? What's giving the most energy efficient design? and allowing us to um, reduce the carbon footprint as well. Um, interior of the building, we have, uh, <clears throat> what we are showing is two large tanks uh, for, fire, for water suppression for fire storage. Um, the building will need to be sprinklered and we don't have the appropriate water flow uh, municipal water service in order to have a, a live sprinkler system. Um, we also have a large mezzanine above the office area for storage, signs, um, any other bolt bins, et cetera, that are, are necessary up there uh, that will be accessed through either a uh, forklift access or a stair that goes up. Um, is, equipment, is equipment being kept outside now? Yes. Some, yes, yes. So a lot of times the grader ends up outside in the wintertime. And it's not good. It's less than ideal, for sure. Yep. yep. With the wings on, yep. literally, you have to climb over the wings to get to the trucks. Yep. Right. And it's 50 years a long time. I mean, 50 years kind of seems like a long time, but on the other hand, what would cause it to not last 50 years? More than uh, that's that's just kind of a, a line in the sand. Um, it, there's what we are designing here should last much longer than 50 years. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. If we wanted to double that lifespan, what would we do? In the design? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I think you know as technologies are evolving, um, I don't I don't know where we will even be in 20 years, for example. Um, but the the construction types, the insulations that are being utilized here, um, there's, there's no reason why this building wouldn't suffice for, for much longer than, than 50 years. Yeah. I mean, I see, I don't know how old, but older stone fire stations mm -hmm. that are, seem to be perfectly good buildings, but they're much smaller than the equipment that's Correct. used these days. Correct. My, my, yes. Michael, Michael said he wanted to check in in 75 years and see whether the condition of the building. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds perfect. We'll, uh, we'll we'll set up a calendar invite. Yeah. Ho hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll meet you there, Michael. We can have a beer. <laughs> but by the way, to folks online, uh, 
we, I can't even see very much of the screen, it's so bright in here. So if you want to say something, don't wait to be called on, just chip in, please. Okay, Scott has making some uh, stupid comments. <laughs> you said it, not me. Anything else that, that piques your interest that I can maybe help answer? No, it's just, I probably could have figured this out before, but uh, so, I, you know, equipment being outside is just not good. <clears throat> not when you're investing in the equipment. The, yeah, there will still be some equipment outside, like yeah. the roadside more. Yeah. Things like that. But the essentials <laughs> that they use in the wintertime needs. Right, right. And, and, and if I can just make a quick comment, Michael, since I really appreciate you being there. And it's kind of been my mantra. Um, and I've been kind of carrying the flag a little bit along with the rest of the select board that it's a really competitive market right now for road foremen now and in the future. I mean, Guthrie can certainly weigh in on this and a facility of, of kind of the state of the art that is really um, encompassing all of the comforts or not even comforts, but what we could we could offer to hiring road foremen for now and in the future. Um, it would be really enticing. It's, you know, everything is not just about money, but it's about the environment that you have to work in. There's a shower. There's, there's, it's not a cold structure. So I, I just think it's, it's a little bit in, in the background, but I think it's really critical that um, we want to, we want to make our employees as comfortable and not even just comfortable, but as efficient, and, and Guthrie can probably um, weigh in on that, but that that's another consideration that I really we need to emphasize to the um, to the community that this is it's it's critical to establish something like this for for that for the for the betterment and uh, and the efficiency of our workers. That, yep, that's a really good point, Scott. And I'll say on August eighteenth at the the tour there. I arrived um, about 20 minutes after it started and there were a couple people who'd been driven out of the building into the parking lot because they couldn't stand being inside with all the smell of the diesel that had gotten into the building walls or whatever other volatile organic carbons there were. Speaking of which, um, again, forgive me for now. So I would, uh, if well, I could chip in for a second. So, um, excuse me, M Michael speaking here, maybe you could speak up, Michael, and then yeah, yeah, continue. Sorry. So what are the energy costs now to operate that building? And what are the projected energy costs in the future based on the design? So we do you have, have, there are, there is information that is available and forgive me, I don't know all of it. Andy had Andy Shapiro had put together um, some modeling and cost implications. Comparing the first year cost and then a 30 year life cycle cost. Um, of four options. So we started at the bottom end with prefab metal building, uh, like a butler building um, with a propane boiler, wood frame building with a propane boiler, wood frame with an air to water heat pump, and then wood frame with a ground source heat pump. Um, and then kind of extrapolated those costs all the way out. Um, I would have to dig into this to fully understand kind of where Andy ended with these. I don't know if you guys are f more familiar with his numbers. I just know no. they exist. I mean, one, one thing to say, I, I don't think you mentioned this, John, is that uh, the heating would be provided by electricity in the, the favored design. And of course the lighting and so on would be electricity. And the design includes photovoltaic panels on the roof yeah. that over the, course, yeah. over the course of the year would provide all of that electricity. So the the investment cost is includes the energy cost over many years. The, the, on an annual basis the after that. The investment the, cost, cost of the uh, energy used in a year or just for the, for the bond? Uh, the, the cost of building the building yeah. will include putting in the, the solar panels yeah. and then those will provide cost-free energy going forward. Right. And just as a rule of thumb, I mean, just a wild guess, is, is, 
whatever the chosen design, how is it going to be less costly energy-wise than on a dollar basis than it is now? Oh, it, it, it will get there over the life of the building, and absolutely. So that's what this. So this bottom graph here is showing the the thirty-year life cycle cost. And the wood framed with the ground source heat and the PV is less costly over the full length, over 30 years, than the prefab metal building with propane boiler. I was thinking about like now. What, what, what's the power, what's the energy bills now for the building? What they're, what they're actively, what, you're, what Guthrie has right now? Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, good. Okay. So was that? Guthrie starting to speak before? Correct, it was. Yeah, uh, so uh, do you have any answers on the current energy cost of the building? Uh, that was all stuff we had forwarded through to Andy so he could do the comparisons. Yeah. Um, it would be a little tricky too because what is fossil fuel that we're heating with now gonna look like in five years, let alone 20 or 30? Exactly. Um, and our building has not much for efficiency right now uh, in the grand scheme of things. It, it does pretty good for what it is, um, surprisingly good actually. Um, but the tricky part is heating all the equipment when it comes in in the winter and things like that um, that kind of skew everything a little bit. And the reason that it doesn't, the new building doesn't look as good in the beginning is, as you said, the initial cost, the shock of putting all the equipment in place compared to what we already have in place. Right. That's We've, I mean, the furnace is a 1974, one of them. There's two furnaces, two, two oil furnaces in the shop now. So, okay. so the efficiencies <laughs> aren't there is what I'm saying. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, uh, and you were starting to talk about something else, I believe, Guthrie? Uh, yeah, the, the equipment outside also. Um, I do believe when we get to the winter portion, um, where the grader would be in for a long period of time, and the roadside mower could also be in that same bay. Um, the drawing, the way it is currently, has the compactor on the back of the grader, which just adds about eight feet or so. And the roadside mower isn't super long to begin with. You could kind of tuck it in there tight when you knew you weren't going to be taking them in and out on a daily basis, where they're going to be in there for a month or more at a time. Okay, thank you. And for the record, Guthrie Perry is a road foreman for the town. Yeah. And also, uh, what Scott had kind of gotten to there, it is going to be... Um, we, we're going to have a new road crew in the next eight years, <clears throat> definitely in the next 10. Um, all of us will either be retired or qualify for retirement. And that's to have this already in place. It's going to be a lot easier to roll over an entire four man crew, possibly more by then um, it, with that structure already in place. It's going to look much more attractive than the neighboring towns. Because um, we're currently in the market for someone, and so is Callis, and so is Plainfield. So it's going to be difficult to fill those positions before snow flies. Thank you. Anything else part of the standard presentation, John? Uh, no, I mean, this, this would be the time where we kind of just open it up for general, right. general back and forth. Right. Um, I think... I think I, what I can speak to, though, is that these are, you know, these meetings are really important and getting the getting the backing of the both the municipality and excuse me, Scott, could you please mute yourself? Yeah. Thank you. Getting the support of the community is is vital, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this doesn't happen without the support of the community. It's also vital for the community to have, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to do everything that we can to answer as many of the questions and provide the information that we can as best that we can uh, in a way that makes people feel good about it, mm -hmm. right? And this is how we this is how we do it. So you know, continue to you know discuss it within you know your community circles and you know get people excited about it because it, I mean, the end result is we have to vote. Right. right, and we have to have a passing vote and a favorable one in order to make something like this happen. But it's a, it's a necessary component of maintaining our infrastructure. 
we need it. So have you been involved in other towns that have built similar structures? Yes, I'm act so I've done a handful. I'm okay. actively working on uh, Milton Public Works okay. right now. So they are under construction. Okay, uh, so in the, in the discussions leading up to, do they have bond votes in these other towns? They as did. Well? In the discussions did. leading up to the bond votes, uh, what were some of the main issues for and against? So you're you're always you're always going to have those questions of well what is what is it going to do to my taxes yeah. what is it and you know that's the first one and then it's like okay well how does this actually benefit me yeah. you know how does how does storing the road grader inside make my life easier yeah. as a taxpayer mm -hmm. right and and the, those those tangible conversations are are kind of hard to draw those correlations mm -hmm. um, but the result is like Guthrie was saying you know if you have if you've got a new facility and you can and you can maintain your staffing, then your roads are going to be in better shape. You know, during the winter time when we've got however many plow trucks you're going to run crews. You know, if you don't, it doesn't matter if you have six trucks if you have two drivers. Yeah. Right. So having having a facility that people are excited to be in and a part of is important. Right. And then when you can have a community that's that's you know, having the support of you know, the, their staff, whether it's coming from the select board or whether it's coming from the, the town offices and you understand, you know, hey, this is, this is how we all come together to make things, these things work well and have a well-oiled machine. Uh, you know, as far as, getting, as far as getting these things passed, I mean, it's, it's really just the outreach part. It's really the making sure that we've provided as many opportunities to answer questions, as many opportunities to say, hey, we've, we've done the research we're, we're professionals, we, this, is, this is how it works, this is the best bang for your buck. Also realizing that there's, as we're seeing, inflation is a real thing. And if we wait and you, and you don't do something, it, is, it will probably never be cheaper. And that's an important piece too. Um, when we did the Milton project, we actually had to cut they, they had an estimate done well before we actually got under, on, under design, and we were constrained because there was, it was separated, mm -hmm. right? So having, having an estimate and, and a schematic design that are aligned is important as well because then the value, your dollar value matches up, right? right? So what the expectation of expenditures are and what you're designing around are aligned. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an important piece. But also just understanding that, you know, you have to, these are vital pieces of the infrastructure, right? If, if, we're, not, if we're not able to maintain roads, people aren't going to want to live here. Your tax base goes down, right? So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you're, you're, you're playing both sides of the coin, right? It, it is, it is a, an expenditure, but there's value, right? There's value for the town. So making, making that known, and, 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 that's, and that's just the discussion piece, right? I mean, there's, the, the easiest way to do that is just having that communication with folks. Right. I think what you did first, where you had the meeting over at the town garage, is paramount. Uh -huh. there's, there is no substitution for walking through that facility and having to step over a wing plow in order to get to the bathroom, yeah. right? Like, that, that, that's what we're, we're like, providing an appropriately sized building for the equipment that we have where you can back a truck in and you're not trying to put three trucks in one bay and you're squeezing it in with two inches to the side and you're going to hit the wall with the wing plow and like that's what we're trying to avoid here with a with a correctly designed building that provides a a longevity for support right okay thank you um Guthrie, on August 18th at the garage, you were telling us about maintenance that you can't do right now that you would be able to do um, with the new facility and also some other maintenance that you do now that involves a dance of, of trucks that would be so much easier to do with the new facility. Could you walk us through some of that, please? Yeah, so uh, anything that we can't really tie a truck up doing maintenance meaning like a two-day maintenance project on it without leaving a truck outside so in the winter you become very limited on how much you can do inside the shop because of not being able to work around one single truck in there if there's another truck in there or the bucket loader has to come back in 
and such things. Um, so that becomes quite tricky. Um, something else I did want to throw in there um, is the uh, November 2nd. Uh, it'd be great to have as many people show up to the shop as possible before that forum. Um, I'm going to have some coffee there. So hopefully people can come get a coffee and also do a walkthrough. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Sell it. I want everyone to see it. And then uh, there, was there was it the drive chain for the sander that you were talking about that you you could do um, a switch on in the new garage and you can't now? Am I remembering that? No. Yeah, we we do them now. Um, okay. the, the tricky part is sometimes the same thing. You got to leave it broken overnight and do it the next day or something okay. like that. Um, okay. Which is where the spare truck comes in to the factor, um, which we now have a spare truck. Uh, which has been a long time in the making. And with that comes this year, uh, we've lost one of our par parking spots to a fire truck. Uh, so we are going to have our spare truck outside for the winter, which is going to be a experiment all on its own. Um, but we're going to try to figure that one out. There is a slim chance we'll get our spot back, but we shall see. Okay, thank you. Andy Shapiro, welcome. Thank you. And Andy Shapiro uh, has been deeply involved in the energy calculations, has led the energy calculations for this, yeah. I, I think it's safe to say. And uh, Michael Duane was earlier asking about the current costs for heating the current building and uh, asking for a comparison of that versus uh, the, what it would be in the new building. Do you have something off the top of your head you could present? Do we have the top of my head? I didn't bring my computer, it has all the stuff. I think it's around 12 grand a year right now. Okay, great. Uh, for oil. Oil. Electric is not much. Yeah. Electric is pretty small, two, 300 kilowatt hours a month or something. Oh, it's okay. not much at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and what would a typical, even though it's gonna be paid off over time, what would a typical heating bill be a year with the new chosen design, approximately? About, my guess is it's around $1,200. Okay. Um, and that's given that there's, that we've got, the project includes 50 kilowatts of PV on the roof. Yep. And um, the, the tariff is such that we about get parity for what we would export and import. Mm -hmm because it's on a demand rate. Yeah. Um, and so the kilowatt hours are only like 13 cents. Uh, the demand rate's 20 bucks a KW. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you export, they now, they will pay 14 cents, I think it is. So it's about the same, yeah. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what they call a preferred site because it's on a roof. So are you saying that the $1,200 a year for electricity, that would be paid to the utility on net for the selling and buying? You can, the, the way it works is what they pay you cannot go against the monthly charge okay. or the efficiency charge. Okay. And those come up to 1200 or Got it. Yeah, around 1200 a year. Right. Um, yeah. And okay. That's, that's assuming that you know, the energy model is correct, yeah. um, which is, you know, it's like an EPA mileage rating. Your mileage will vary. Right. And it'll vary by year. It'll vary by thermostat setting and, yeah. and inaccuracy of the model. Right. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Great. I figure if the model's within 20% of what happens, that's pretty that's good. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, it could, it could end up being a couple thousand dollars or... Maybe twenty five hundred. I don't know where it could be, but it won't be less than eleven hundred mm -hmm. because that's the base. That that's that's the, min, the minimum service right. charge. Service charge plus the <laughs> get around those. Right. Okay. Great. And that's for, with the ground source heat pump. Yeah. And for people who have more questions, we do have a special. I think it's a special page on our website, right, at eastmontpelierVT.org, that's devoted to all sorts of documents about this project, and uh, th there. Uh, was it a different version of the presentation covering much of the same thing, mm -hmm. but getting different questions at the uh, the previous forum that was held here in the elementary school, and that is available through Orca Media. So people can take a look at that. Okay. Anything else that people would like to raise? 
You're probably, you're probably going to have a lot of people voting. This is going to be in the November. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be a lot of people voting. I, right. Because it's a presidential year. Right. So that's either good or bad, depending on how it turns out. But I think a lot of people are going to vote. So. So we hope that a lot more people get informed. And, yeah. So I, I was going to say, so if a lot more people get informed mm -hmm. in a positive way, that this is important. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little different than a lot of things because you're you're actually buying something you can see and feel. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but there's going to be a lot of people voting. So, um, the last <clears throat> town meeting, something about 36, 38 percent of the registered voters voted, and um, then there was a school revote, and 27 percent of the people voted on that school revote, despite all of the things that were talked about and said in, mm -hmm. on, in the news. So I imagine there's going to be, and usually East Montpelier has a very good turnout of people who vote, who are registered voters in a presidential election. Yeah. So if people are against it, a lot of people are going to vote, and then they might vote against it. Mm -hmm. And if a lot of people are for it, then those people are going to come out. So, so either way, a lot of people are going to come out right. and vote. Right. Hey, hey, if, I, if, if I could just jump in, Michael. We toy, talked about this. We had a kind of a, a decent conversation last night, the uh, select board meeting. And we're really going to try to promote our next meeting, um, the October meeting. We even talked about, not, not, nothing's, nothing's been decided yet, but, but we're really going to try to incentivize the constituents of town to come out and really learn about what this is. We're, we're thinking about maybe having another open house at the garage and, and really trying to get the, um, the members of the town to come out and learn about what the issues are and how important and critical it is for the functioning of East Montpelier. So rather than just put some stuff on French Porch Forum, Front Porch Forum, this is going to be a major push um, that that Jennifer is involved in, and and a and a push by the select board. Just FYI, we we this was this was kind of paramount for a conversation that we had last night. Yes, we're going to serve Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We're going to serve Ben and Jerry's ice cream and fish will play. Okay. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to get Springsteen too. <laughs> I, I had a suggestion that uh, maybe Seth can provide hamburger and we can have uh, hamburgers and corn and Be great. Uh, ice cream and have it, you know, food gets people sometimes there. Yeah. Off it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, make it kind of like a party and, uh, you know, have a, have a cookout. A harvest yeah. fest. So, Michael, I'll yeah. put you on the spot. Uh, having, having seen what you've seen here, is this something you think you could support? Yes, very much so. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, Reminds me of some of the WEC projects I was involved with, you know, and, and even one of the earlier school projects. Mm -hmm. S stuff that's uh, concrete, figuratively and literally, mm -hmm. people can see that. Right. You know, and I remember, I think Andy, you were involved in this. One of the additions on the school, yeah. the school would say, you know, 50% of this bond is things you aren't going to be able to see because it's in the walls, right. you know? And so having people come to the place, mm -hmm. to the site, mm -hmm. I think is very important mm -hmm. to see it as time. Right, we, we, we think that we're gonna, we're gonna we, we, we think we'll add maybe another um, viewing of the current town garage, kind of on your suggestion, Michael, yes. And we had the one and maybe we'll have another one. You can't do enough outreach and I'm, uh, uh, you, you just can't. Can't. Agree with you 100%. You can't do enough. Guthrie, another question to you. Uh, if somebody says, uh, we, we've talked about the importance of the work environment to be able to track uh, a new road crew in the future. If someone says to you, well, road crew's out on the road. Um, how important is it that the garage be an attractive place to be? That's where you store equipment. Uh, Talk, talk to us about that. How, how, how much time do you guys spend working in the garage itself? So in the summer, it's definitely less time in the garage. Uh, there's still the maintenance. Um, we've had a truck in there doing a service on it 
uh, what was that Monday? Um, and it dragged into Tuesday morning for an hour, but, um, and that was, it's not bad in the summer when there's no wings on and there's only the one truck in the shop, there's room to work around it. Um, and then in the winters where it gets really tricky, you end up in, in under trucks, you have to go over trucks to get to the other truck. You can't get to an actual workbench. If you need a tool, you might have to climb over another truck to go get a tool. So it becomes very tedious <laughs> to say the least. Mm. So that's, yeah. that's why when we have the open house, we put all the plow equipment on, bring all the equipment in that would normally be in there on any winter day. Mm. And Thank you. it's, I was kind of surprised at how shocked everyone else that came uh, in August really was about how tight the quarters were. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Do, have you done any estimate of how much um, how much efficiency could be gained with the new garage? How many uh, hours per week uh, on, over the course of a year you guys end up spending uh, hopping over plows and moving trucks and that sort of thing to do maintenance? Not, re not really. Um, okay. What would be nice is to be able to work on like each operator kind of has their own truck that they stick with. Um, yeah. And it would be nice to be able to say, oh, I'm going to go do this to my, my truck and not say, well, I'm going to do this to my truck. So I have to take somebody else's truck outside. Right. And it, it would be more of a consistent thing where everyone can be doing maintenance at the same time. So mm. especially in the winter, that would be a big one for me. All right. Thank you. Just one Mike. more other, uh, one additional point about promoting it. Um, there is going to be a big turnout in November. On the other hand, uh, the tax bills just came out, mm -hmm. and it's hard sometimes mm -hmm. to, you know, look at it in detail and distinguish the town portion versus the school portion. Yeah. But when the total tax bill came out last week, boy, it, it raised your eyebrows, mm -hmm. you know. Sure so, um, in that context, this bond is going to be being put out there. Yeah. So you got the tax bill that just came out, big turnout in November, and then a money project. So just things to think about. Yep, good point. And um, see the videos of the town garage, are those up on the website as well, Jen? Not yet, no. Okay, so we have some videos uh, that uh, our select board member, Ms. Christensen, took. Um, so we'll, I think we'll get them up on the website. Yeah, okay. That way people who haven't gotten to the open house will be able to, to see how crowded it can be mm. in there. It's pretty astonishing when you go in there with all the gear in there, how crowded it is. Yeah. And those trucks look two times bigger than they look outside. Mm. I mean, it's really yeah. packed in there. With Big stuff. And then, oops, sorry. <laughs> yep. Um, it's packed with stuff in there, and it got through. It was showing us where one of the plows they had to cut a little bit off the end of it in order to get it in and out. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, uh, but yeah, seeing it. I mean, if we can just get people over there somehow. Uh -oh. Jen, did we, are we obligated to uh, hold this forum until a certain time? Can I talk that? Um, not that I'm aware. Yeah. Okay. 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 So let's see. One more chance for any questions or comments. No. Great. I could comment. Yes, yeah, Stephen. All right. Um, uh, It seems to me that when this process started, there wasn't much public input into what we were going to buy. And now I'm hearing a lot of focus on the old facility and we seem to be skipping over how it was that we ended up with this building and these numbers. 
So when I originally heard that we were going to tear down the existing garage, I thought, well, it looks straight to me. And I thought it could be recycled into something that could at least park a truck in, even if you weren't going to work in it. But after visiting, I saw that the structure is pretty decrepit and not worth saving, and it's in the way. So I got behind, let's take it down. And, and for me, that was the end of that. It's not worth talking about how much it costs to heat the old building or anything about the old building. It's we're moving past that. And I think we should be focusing more on how we ended up with the design that we're looking at. And, and I wouldn't be saying this if it was small change. This is a lot of money. It's not even just the cost to buy it. It's how much it costs to pay for it. And so I guess I'm really interested in hearing more about the design of the structure, how that was chosen, what the biggest bang for the buck sounds good, but show us what our options were that you decided that wasn't uh, the best approach. I think that would make people, me, feel more confident that this is the correct path for this expenditure. And um, I'm a guy that knows about building and I'm curious about, you know, what are the, what are the roof trusses? What's the material on the roof? How are you going to put perforations through it to put the racking for the PVs? Are these PVs uh, micro inverters? Uh, and then I would like to know more about the ground source heat pumps and what kind of Freon, who else has them? What's the track record? I mean, maybe this is too much for people, but it isn't for me. I'm ready to hear this stuff. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know this is really tough, but this is the world that I'm in. And so I'm just sharing what I'm thinking. And uh, uh, I guess that's it. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, because you, you were heading in one direction in my mind, Stephen, and, and then you ended up somewhere else than what I had expected. So uh, were, you, were you at all interested in the question of overall dimensions of the building, how many bays, what sort of uh, design parameters in terms of how much equipment could be put in there, or, or are you really just interested in these in the weeds questions? You're, you accept that the overall design, uh, size-wise, uh, um, including a break room and showers and so on, that all that makes sense, and, and you want to know about the details. If it's possible, if it's if it's doable, I think it would be helpful. If it's uh, not possible if, if that information is just buried too deep and it's and it's impossible to to dig it out then then I would be able to accept that other people made good choices. I'm just sharing with you my thoughts and feelings as uh, we're faced with this um, choice and and I think your um, feedback on my question is very helpful for me, Carl. It helps me to um, understand uh, my confusion, really, is what um, I'm facing. Uh, I just have so much, um, well, I wouldn't say uncertainty, but just a lack of clarity about how the choices were made uh, to come up with this design. And, and what would it have looked like if it was a million dollars less or a million dollars more? I mean, how is it that this process was um, uh, performed without, um, well, without any public input? Well, uh, John and Andy, do you want to take a, a stab at that? Well, I, I think the form of the building came out of just the size of the equipment. I think that's, would that be fair to say, John, that, you know, this is a plan that accommodates all the gear we've got. Right. So in its infancy, the design team 
responded to the pro forma that was provided by Guthrie and the town. So, okay, here are the, here are the, the units, the boxes that we have to work around, that we have to incorporate into, into the design. That gave us kind of the general framework. Then we started down a path and it's like, okay, we're, we were tasked with looking at a, I think it was three, three different assemblies. It's two different enclosures and four, four mechanical systems. And so what we did is we looked at a, a metal building and then a wood building. And we said, okay, and took a look at those and then took a look at the energy usage as, a po as compared to those four systems inside of those two envelopes. And then we took that and moved that into the estimate process and said, okay, once we build this out, what does it cost? How does it, how does it then extrapolate over, over time through Andy's energy model? And that's what really brought us to, okay, based on these systems, here is the, the estimated cost for, for a building. And then how do we feel about the the energy efficiency and how do we feel about the the impact to the environment and, and how are we creating a building that meets all those needs and still fits within a palatable financial window, right? Um, so I think we do have information on how we got to where to the chosen design. Um, and that goes kind of with, with, any, with any of these projects where we, we, we have to vet different systems. And we have to be, you have to go deep enough that you have a good understanding of why you chose what you chose. But we are still very, very early in the design process. Um, there's, there's still movement and motion that will happen. I guarantee you this won't look exactly like this when we're done. It will look very, very similar. But there will be things that change. There, there will be there will be changes to the design based on either environmental impacts or product availability or value management processes. Um, so we're, not, we're definitely not done. We're just trying to make a project that is both viable and affordable. If I could take a shot at answering your question, Stephen, and tell me if this gets at what you're thinking and maybe other people could say whether they think this might be a helpful discussion to have with a broader audience. Um, so the first thing, like John said, was Guthrie came up with, this is how much space we need to accommodate our equipment. And then um, when I first got involved with it as part of the energy committee, um, I said, oh, what are you thinking about for this building? And, and Seth said, oh, I don't know, we'll probably get a butler building and put a boiler in it, essentially. And I said, oh, okay, um, I think there's some other alternatives. Would you be open for for us to look at some other alternatives. And the select board said, yeah, let's look at the alternatives. So in addition to the steel building, we looked at the wood building. The wood building's more efficient. It's actually better insulated, better air sealed than the metal building. Um, and um, then for the metal building, we looked at two options, which would be a pellet boiler or a propane boiler. Um, the engineer we're working with has done a bunch of garages for AOT, for the state. And what they're doing in these garages is putting in radiant floor. And it turns out that that's the best one. It's got a bunch of advantages. It, it melts stuff off the trucks. It warms up the trucks well. It handles all the moisture that drops off the trucks. Um, and it also has another benefit, which I didn't realize until, I, until we talked about this project, which is that Generally, in these kind of projects, when you open the doors on these things on a winter morning and get all the trucks out, the whole thing gets filled with minus 10 degree air, and that's a huge heat load. Boom, all at once. If you wanted to recover that with a, a blower, you'd have to have like a million BTU per hour blo uh, blowers. It'd be a lot. But the floor covers that. The floor uh, stores all that heat in the concrete, and it warms up that air when you close the doors again. So, and uh, so you eliminate the need for these big blowers, plus it's better for drying the trucks and keeping the trucks happy. Um, once you then have a radiant floor, you can heat that with, uh, and we looked at four options, a propane boiler, pellet boiler, uh, a ground source heat pump, 
and what's called an air to water heat pump. It, the outside unit looks a lot like the, the heat pumps you see everybody putting in now. But instead of uh, sending refrigerant lines inside to the units on the wall, it heats a tank of water. And then that tank of water can then can heat the floor. Uh, and the ground source heat pumps, you know, take the heat out of the ground and put that into a tank of water and that then is distributed through the floors. Um, and it turns out to be a good match with the heat pump because you only need like 100 degree water in the floor at a very cold outside temperature. And heat pumps make 100 degree water very efficiently. If you want to make 120, not so efficient. But 100 degree water, they're very efficient. Um, so we looked at all those options and I ran an energy model um, where we looked at the heat load for every hour of the year based on historical weather data. Um, and now it's getting warmer, but so maybe, maybe even the energy is a little less than I said, but uh, I thought that was, that's the only weather files we have to run these things. And we looked at what's the heat load every hour of the year and what's the efficiency of all four systems under all those conditions every hour of the year and projected what the annual consumption of energy would be. Uh, and we can also look at the peak values. And the ground source heat pump in the middle of winter, it's maybe dealing with 35 degree temperature in, in the ground because you've been sucking heat out of the ground all fall, right? So the ground gets colder and colder and it'll get down to freezing. But with an air source heat pump that's pulling heat out of the air, now you're pulling air heat out of minus 10 degree air or zero degree air. So they just don't, they can do it. And, and these cold climate heat pumps will do it but it's just not near as efficient, and you end up with a big demand spike in the coldest weather. Those things are working really hard, and you're paying $20 a kilowatt um, for that. Um, it'll be on a demand rate. So the, the ground source heat pump turned out to have, um, it's more expensive to build, but it's much more efficient, which means you need a smaller PV array to, to offset all the energy than the air to water. The air to water had something like a 40 kilowatt peak, and the ground source had something like a 20 kilowatt peak. So that cuts in half your demand charges, because when you hit that demand once, you're charged for it for 12 months. And it seems, it seems like they're hitting you up for something they shouldn't, but that's not true, because if you hit 40 kW, they have to contract for that energy mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. And attention. they have to have it available every month of the year, even yeah. though you're not going to use it. So you pay. Um, so those 20 kW at 20 bucks a whack is four, you know, $400 a month. It's like five grand for the year that the ground source heat pump saves. So it ended up having the lowest life cycle cost. It was about even, but the feds are now paying 40% of the cost for a whole ground source heat pump system, including the distribution. So that's worth like over $150,000 on this project. Mm -hmm. uh, and that bumped the ground source heat pump to the, to the best deal. The life cycle cost analysis showed they were about the same, the two heat pumps, and they were better than the pellets or the um, right. propane the by a fair bit, both of them. Okay. Plus Thank the you. carbon emissions is half, or, or actually about a tenth of what it would be if you're burning something. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then so in terms of the buildings themselves, the, the wood buildings have about half the embodied carbon of the metal buildings. So all the, all the carbon dioxide that's emitted to produce the materials to build the building is half on a wood building as it is on the steel building. Okay, so thank, thank you for that. So <laughs> Stephen, does, that, does that, that, that address some of the questions that you had? Yes, it's all very interesting. And um, every time I hear this, I learn more. So thank you for um, that great explanation. I know it really takes a lot of energy to do that, and I appreciate it. So I think that this is the stuff that should be brought to the community, if anybody um, is um, at the next meeting that hasn't heard this stuff before, I think it would be really helpful in selling the project. I'm not opposed to this project. I just want to make sure that we're choosing the right pieces because it's a lot of money yep it mm -hmm. it is and that's that is a, a good concern to, to bring to the table let me riff on that theme a little bit by asking a, a broader question about design philosophy 
And let me give an example of, of a simple design philosophy. If you have a bicycle or a piece of backpacking equipment, you can say, OK, you can build something that's inexpensive, durable, or light, pick any two. Mm -hmm. uh, you can build a, a bicycle that's, that's uh, durable and, and very light, but it's going to cost a lot, for example. Or it can be uh, inexpensive and durable, but it's going to be very heavy. Um, I've heard a lot of different uh, desirable traits for a building to have, adequate room for equipment, uh, to ha have affordable uh, temperature uh, control, uh, affordable energy, um, afford um, low embodied energy, aesthetics, you might, we haven't talked about, I don't think, but you might throw that in. You talked a little bit about that in your presentation, but you throw that in. Um, it, what, what are the main design parameters that you've thought about in designing this, and what sort of priorities have you given? To them. Affordability, of course, would be another one. So the, the building analog to what you said is good, fast, and cheap. Okay. You get two out of okay. this. <laughs> so would you care to, um, which, which two have you prioritized in this design? Well, at $5 million, it's not cheap. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, what, is that approaching 500 a square foot, 450? Yeah, we're, we're in that range. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's astonishing what stuff costs now yeah. to build. I mean, when we built our house, this was like 12 years ago, 13 years ago, 250 a square foot. Right. For a living space. Yeah. yeah. And this is commercial, so it's going to be more per square foot. But yeah. still, it's just gone up like crazy. So in the building world, cheap doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it can be a little cheaper. Okay. But that's, right. that's kind of it. Yeah. So this is good and fast. And, and, and I think we're on it. We, you know, one of the reasons we chose your firm was that they were available to do the work, uh -huh. and so that's that's as fast as we can go. Okay. And um, you know, with the bond vote in November, if it passed, it's going to be what two, three months before you have construction drawings that fast. Yeah. So that puts us into February, March, and that's sort of getting toward the end that's of the, the end optimal of bidding window. Uh -huh. You really like to bid stuff out, what, like January, February? If it can um, be on the street, then it's better. Uh, yeah, because okay. nobody's got their, their dance cards aren't full yet. Right. So they're sharpening their pencil. Right. But you go in April and go, oh, yeah, I could add that onto my list if you pay enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we're sort of, it's sort of tight, but it's, it's pretty fast. It's a pretty fast track. Okay. It's a fairly simple building, but still, there's always a lot of detail to work out. And, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff? Okay, thank you. John, how would you answer the question about design philosophy? So I think um, the most important thing when we are dealing with buildings like this is practicality. Right. So we have to make sure that the building is functional for its intended need. Then we need to make sure that we are doing something that provides, <clears throat> provides the longevity. So that, that speaks to the good part. Right, so we want to make sure that we're we're on the you know on the, the good side of the design that's providing a, a building that is not gonna it's not gonna fall down in ten years, right? Um, and then the efficiency part is 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 important because that's how that's how you can you can I don't want to necessarily you don't rob Peter to pay Paul, but you kind of do, right? Where you can, you can afford better things as you extrapolate it across the life of the building. And if the life of the building is intended to be a long, a long span, then, you, then the solar panels and the ground source heat pump and the things that make, that improve the design mm -hmm. are then viable because, because you've incorporated that into the life cycle analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the, we can make it look good, but in, the intent is that it's a, it's a serviceable building. Right, so we're going to make it as attractive as we can without increasing cost, right? Mm -hmm. So the, to kind of to tie a bow around it, you know, we do not have infinite pockets to reach into, yeah. right? So we are trying to be cognizant and lean on the experiences that we have. The, the project analysis that we've done says, hey, here's what we can do. Here's what we can deliver in this time frame, in this budget window. And then this gives you a building that you're going to be proud of, mm -hmm. right? And that Guthrie is going, and his team is, is going to be excited to work in, mm -hmm. right? And then the townsfolk are, you know, hey, they, we, we got a great building. 
And we did everything that we could to make sure that we were, we were efficient with the, the design monies and the building monies that are going into this. So it's, it's multifaceted. Mm-hmm. The way you answer the question is, is, is very difficult. It's not, you know, there's so many different ways that you have to consider how we, how we get to even a building like this. It's not, it's not simple, right? And it, having, having ground source heat pumps and PV is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and we th- and we feel it's important, you know. Um, Andy Andy spoke on the you know, the embodied carbon, right? You know, how are we affecting our environment, right? All those things kind of fold in. So it's it's a it's a multifaceted approach to find the the right pieces that fit this puzzle. Very good. Thank you. It also turned out that in the cost analysis, the metal building wasn't that much cheaper because uh, mm-hmm. steel was gone up so much. Right. Right. Uh, I thought, oh, we're going to have a lot, we're going to have a big hurdle to overcome because this really good wood building to me was way more expensive. It wasn't way more expensive, which was really interesting right. to me. Um, one thing that I've appreciated about what they've done here is it's a very simple structure. Unlike the fire station, I lost that battle. It has all these elements to it. And, you know, sometimes contractors can price a building by the number of corners. <laughs> That's got a lot of corners. This one doesn't have a lot of corners. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. It's, you know, so I really appreciate that they come up with a really utilitarian, mm-hmm. simple design. It's just a simple flat plane shed roof on a box. It's got one little corner out of it just because that office doesn't have to be as big as the rest of it. But um, it's, it's a simple building. Um, and, that's and, okay. then, and then, you know, like in my work with with high performance building design consulting, I ask people, what is it you want this building to express in terms of your relationship to the environment and the planet? Because you're putting, uh, you're putting out a lot of energy, a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, even for the best building. Yeah. And then how can we minimize that and, how can, we, and can we afford to do it? And um, it turns out it's not costing us much more to do this building right than to do the cheapest building that would have a pretty big impact. Yeah. And um, I have graphs that show this, bar charts. You know, Here's the energy cost for the existing building. Here it is for the metal building. And here it is for all the options we looked at. Um, and you know, this is too much to look at all at once. But uh, if you look at that one in the middle, I think, is that the carbon dioxide emissions? This is. Yeah, so you can see <laughs> for the four buildings, once you put in the heat pumps and that's not, even, that's not even considering the solar. It's because Washington Electric electricity is pretty clean. Right. Um, what, the, what the solar panels do for you is pre-buy all your energy for 30 years yeah. at, at a discount. You know, those, that electricity costs you like 10, 11 cents a kilowatt hour um, the, off of photovoltaics. Um, so the cost is lower, the emissions are lower, and the, um, the, the operating cost is lower, the emissions are lower, and the construction cost is not that much different. So that's, that was kind of, you know, asking about design philosophy. It's trying to get, trying to meet the owner's environmental goals and energy goals at the least cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, when you say least cost, that's a life cycle cost. Right. Okay. Further questions or comments? Thank you. I'm going to head out. Very good. Thanks. Nice to see you. Good. So we will then adjourn. I guess this is a meeting, so we, is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, is there a second? We can have Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The meeting's adjourned at uh, about uh, 7.35, it looks like. 7.34.